All right, everybody, finally moving on from World War I. So let's talk now about the Roaring Twenties. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard conversation regarding this uh, in, since now is the year 2020. Um, kind of go, the ideas of let's go back to the 20s, let's wear flapper dresses and stuff like that. But uh, it turns out the Roaring Twenties, let me see if I can whoop, adjust in my picture a little bit here. Let's see if I can uh, get a little doodle thing going here. All right, here we go. Yeah, it turns out the Roaring Twenties um, are not all, you know, flapper dresses and swanky parties and things like that. So let's get into this, okay? Back to normal or not, and right here I'm going to put a question mark, okay, because we came through the Great War, and so on the other side, when we say, okay, well, things are back to normal, certain things were never going to be the same. Certain things were never going to just go straight back to how they were. Um, so let's let's talk through that. Let's talk about the impact of World War One. Number one, right here. Circle number one, the economy, okay? When the soldiers returned home, the government didn't need extra workers to make supplies for them anymore. This led to high unemployment. Well, that makes sense, right? Okay, because we've got soldiers needing jobs. Oh, 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 oops, bam. Soldiers needing jobs. And then we also have civilians in those jobs but now fewer jobs all around okay question mark question mark that's what those wiggles are sorry Question mark, okay? Because so we had people that were able to return from the war. They come home, they're looking for a job, or they're looking to get their old job back, and it's not there, okay? Because the civilians have taken over those jobs. Also, uh, the workforce was expanded, used more civilians to make um, resources during wartime, but those are now being cut back as well. Okay, so we have a lot of people looking for jobs and not a whole lot of jobs to go around. And again, that's not good. If you can't make money, you can't spend money. If you can't spend money, you can't support your local economy. So uh, things are starting to get pretty touchy already, just with number one. All right, number two, circle that, labor. Wages and prices had been kept down during the war. After the war, prices went up, but not wages right here, leading to strikes, okay? Um, it, you'll hear people now uh, striking for better pay or uh, more commonly what I hear is a is cost of living increase, okay? So if I put here cost of living, basically what that means is um, say you are working for me at my company and we make, um, I don't know, uh, remote control car tires. I don't know. That's the first thing I thought of. And so if I continue, you know, if I say, okay, you're all right here, you still have your job. And I promise that I will pay you the same amount for the next 10 years. You know, that sounds like a good deal, right? Like that sounds amazing. Like you have job security now, right? Except just as a natural function of the economy within those 10 years, there are going to be things that get more expensive. You may end up moving um, or trying to buy a house and end up paying more than just, you know, a, a little apartment, you know, and so your cost of living, the money you expend just to exist, living um, situations like rent or a mortgage, 
uh, food, price of food goes up, uh, price of gasoline for your car to actually come to this job that you've been guaranteed, um, that kind of thing. Those are going to increase um, at least once in that decade, if not, you know, multiple times. But if I said, nope, it's in the contract, I'm going to pay you the exact same amount. At a certain point, it might be possible for you to have had this fairly well-paying job with my company, but then go to where you cannot afford even just the cost of living. So um, it's not uncommon when we talk about um, raising wages to use the term a cost of living increase. So you know, hey, uh, within the past year or two years or however, uh, the price of groceries has gone up or the price of gasoline has gone up. And so we need some sort of proportional raise in uh, the wages that are being earned or else we're just not going to be able to afford to live. OK, cost of living. Uh, I would be pretty upset about that, too, by the way. All right. Number three nativism and racism okay with a lack of jobs racism and anti-immigrant feelings rose quote they're taking our jobs okay so racism we've talked about that where you dismiss an entire group uh, ethnic group or race of people um saying they're all bad or they're all here to hurt us or they're all here to take our jobs or something like that. We've talked about treating someone differently just because of their ethnicity or their race. Now, nativism here, nativism, I'm going to underline it. Nativism is, quote, Americans first. Okay. Um, so if you had, uh, if you run across someone, say, that uh, you, you look like you could potentially be from another country, okay, uh, and you, you try to get hired on for a, for a job uh, somewhere and they say, no, no, we hire Americans first. We, we, you know, if we've exhausted all of our, our resumes of the Americans who have applied, then we might consider yours. Um, or no, 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 if, uh, if we're going to do welfare, well, we're going to serve the Americans first. Uh, and if we're going to, um, you know, provide any sort of uh, bonus or safety net for the people, well, we're going to do the Americans first, okay? So uh, this nativism uh, went from simple, you know, pragmatism, like, okay, let's take care of the citizens before we take care of the immigrants, um, uh, or, or something like that. It, it, it went from just a simple plan to, uh, no, we're not going to help anyone who's not an American. We have to help all the Americans first. Uh, almost to the exclusion, if not totally to the exclusion of anybody else, okay? So you can see how that would make life complicated for uh, all the people who are still, you know, technically considered immigrants, uh, regardless of how long they had actually actually been here. Uh, they were starting to be excluded in society. All right, so let's talk about the Red Scare. Okay, now this is not that they were afraid of the color red, okay? This is more um, of what we spoke about at the end of World War I uh, with communism, okay? So, Americans were afraid the communist takeover in Russia would repeat itself in the U.S. and put an end to capitalism. Now, I'm going to put a star by this. Again, we talked about what communism is, where everything... Um, that is produced, goes back to the government, um, and so every sort of resource that you've got, jobs, um, groceries, everything like that, and it goes to the government, and then the government divvies it back out. And the idea being the, that you would be able to treat people the same, okay? Um, 
and that everybody would have a shot, okay, uh, to do this. Now, it has been shown that these sorts of communist, and we're about to get to uh, socialism as well, that these sorts of models do not work um, in practice. There are quite a few um, examples actually just in recent news uh, of countries where this has been tried and it does not in fact work. Uh, my, I was good friends uh, with Excuse me. I was good friends with a girl um, whose uh, father was in the Air Force, and she used to tell me these tremendous stories of all these places that she lived. And uh, one of the funniest ones uh, that I had heard was her, her her mother had asked her father to pick up something at the grocery store. Okay, so something uh, normal, you know, just see if they have uh, bread or see if they have. Uh, something okay so something totally normal and the husband said the, the father her father said uh, sure I'll look but they might only have size 8 women's pumps left and I didn't understand why a specific size of women's high heels had anything to do with whatever she had just asked him uh, to pick up at the store and so I asked my friend and she said well in these countries where um, this was this particular reference was to an event that happened in the Ukraine um, in these countries where they've tried these different scenarios it would not be uncommon to walk by stores one day and there's you know hardly anyone in line uh, or and then walk by the next day and <sighs> excuse me, and then walk by the next day and then suddenly everyone's in line and that was how people could tell how useful the items were that were available in the shop that day. Uh, and that one one day, uh, on one of the less crowded days, uh, she had gone with her, uh, either, either with her mother or with both, both parents, and the item that they had most of, and we're talking like, piles and shelves and lots and lots of these uh, that the item that they had in the store that day uh, were size 8 women's high heels in white color, you know, made out of white um, fabric or leather or whatever, probably not leather. Um, so size 8 white women's pumps, high heels. And she said it was just the most amazing thing because here they are at the store they're needing to try and get what they need to survive but that's not what the government had to give out at that particular day so unfortunately they were just out but if they wanted some size 8 white women's pumps they could have gotten that because there were plenty of those anyways um very very interesting situation compared to uh the the um society that we live in over here okay and they were um uh, at this point the americans were really worried that uh, this wave was actually going to sweep the world like it wasn't just going to be a revolution um lenin taking over in Russia was not just going to be a revolution over there, but that it was actually going to sweep through the world and potentially impact America. So everybody got really nervous uh, because we wanted to protect what we perceived as our freedom uh, to to have a, a sort of capitalistic economy. And uh, everybody, you know, kind of having opportunities uh, to earn money and um and to spend money and get what they need and not having so much control. Again, remember, America has, from the get-go, preferred smaller government um, interaction than other countries, um, smaller governments, smaller amounts of government control. So this was a big, 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 big concern, okay? Now, the Red Scare was a fear of communists or reds okay and other quote radicals all right so at this point there were um bombings um and other sort of 
Uh, pardon me, there were uh, bombings and other sorts of terrorist activity, and they immediately thought, uh, society over here as a whole, immediately thought, oh, it's the Reds, it's the Commies, uh, they're, they're coming to take over, they're coming to destabilize our way of life. So, here we have Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, and he led the Palmer Raids on suspected communists, socialists, and anarchists, okay? So he got the idea, the Attorney General got the idea that he was going to lead these raids um, and try to root out any sort of major difference of opinion or um, uh, terroristic or anarchic opinions. He was going to root this out. But if you can see this little fox here, but no major discoveries were ever made, okay? So this was clearly not an effective tactic, okay? Um, and especially here, this last part of the sentence, often without warrants, okay? So he wasn't even following due process. He didn't apparently have to prove to anyone that he really had evidence enough to raid these particular people. He just had to be like, oh, but I think they're communist. And that was the uh, that was enough permission for him to act on, uh, which we've talked about the importance of due process and how important it is uh, to not uh, give anybody the power to just, you know, raid or um, uh, throw people in jail for, for no good reason or just for a, a hunch or a gut feeling, okay? Labor unions were deemed communist organizations, and when workers began to strike, violent government intervention was seen as justified. Okay? Violent government intervention was seen as justified. Now, we have talked about, in the past, freedom of speech and how we live currently in a country where we are allowed to even disagree with our president, with our leadership. We have the ability to, um, if we have a complaint or a concern, we have the ability to pass it up the chain. Um, we have a very, very awesome opportunity anytime uh, that we come up against something that we really struggle with or uh, disagree with. <sighs> Excuse me, we have this awesome opportunity to actually communicate those, and it could actually be, um, you know, turned into a, a law, or it could actually change the way things work. Now, it's a lot of hard work to do that. You can't just, you know, stroll into Congress and be like, hey, I want to outlaw pineapple on pizza, and then, you know, the next day, uh, that goes into law. Obviously, it's a long process, but this can actually happen. Uh, and I have friends that are advocates that do actually affect these changes. It's an amazing thing to have a system that will allow this. Um, but here, all the workers were doing, they were striking. Uh, they did not want to uh, be associated with communism. Um uh, some of them did not want to be associated with the unions if they were communism, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. So in all of this unrest, when they struck, when they went on strike, um, violent government intervention was seen as justified. So it doesn't mean that if the people who were on strike got violent, that the uh, government would respond with violence. No, the government uh, was it was seen as justified for the government to basically to come out swinging, uh, which is not, it's not great. It's not great because these are still citizens that we're talking about here. Okay. So this is, this is showing you how, how scared everybody was, how panicky, uh, because that's when, uh, things get, that's when things get dangerous. Um, that's when things get, um, really, really, uh, they can get really intense. They can get out of hand really, really quickly. Uh, is when you have a large amount, large group of uh, scared people, anxious people. Okay, let's talk about socialism real quick. Socialism, a system in which property and the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. Now, how is that not communism? Well, communism controls the resources. Okay. Communism, everything goes into a communal 
pot, a communal sort of thing, and then it is redistributed by the government. Socialism is where the government puts all of the production measures in place and also goes so far as to dictate um, with ha how these resources are then able to be used, okay? System in which property and the means of production are owned and controlled by the state, okay? It's not as simple as making something, giving it to the government for redistribution. The government actually owns the creation process and ultimately owns uh, or has the final say as to where these resources go. Socialism, okay? The trial and execution of Nicola Sacco and Bartol Bartolomeo Vanzetti suggested that the Red Scare had a nativist foundation. Again, remember, nativists. Uh, Americans first. Americans are best. Americans are the only people worth trusting. Anybody who's not an American, um, you know, is garbage. That kind of thing. Nativist. Okay. The two Italian-born anarchists were sentenced to death for killing two men during a robbery. They probably didn't get a fair trial. Um, now, I am going to try to remember to find here my podcast episode where it actually uh, goes into depth of, as to what actually happened to Sacco and Vanzetti and the reason why they sort of looked perfect for the crime, the reason why they were probably bulldozed um, through the quote-unquote uh, fair trial process and then uh, sentenced to death and executed. Um, if I can find that detail, I will post it for you guys for a little bit of enrichment learning because I really think you'll find the whole thing interesting. And it's very, um, it, it illustrates a, a lot of uh, what was going on um, in the social, emotional kind of sphere at this time. Harding's Republicanism, okay? Okay. Americans wanted to return to the, quote, normal way of life before the war, right? Who wouldn't at this point? You would just want things to go back to normal, uh, whether they could or not. During the 1920 presidential election, I'm going to underline that, we're in 1920 now, Warren G. Harding, a Republican senator from Ohio, made this idea his campaign promise. A strong believer in small government, as president, he instituted income tax reductions, especially for the wealthy, and high tariffs. Okay? So he even went so far as to promise people, oh yeah, I'll get things back to normal. And that was his... Uh, whole campaign, basically, as president, was centered around this idea that he could get us back, quote, to normal, okay? So now we have, like, how, how does he, how exactly does it put all of that into place? Harding appointed his friends from Ohio, okay, that's where he, that's where he came from, that's where he was uh, in a position before he became president, and many of these friends were unqualified and corrupt. And he appointed them to important positions. So that's obviously not good, right? Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall was convicted of accepting bribes from oil executives for rights to drill on government land in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, which became known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. I'm going to underline that. When Harding died of a heart attack, on August 2nd, 1923, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, became president. Um, so, Harding here uh, was not the best. Okay, Harding was not great for the country. And unfortunately, for Calvin Coolidge, he sort of inherited this mess suddenly uh, when Harding died of the heart attack, okay? So let's talk about how Calvin Coolidge then 
uh, takes this and goes forward. Okay. He was seen as quiet and honest, probably a nice change um, from Harding, who was appointing all of these people who were unqualified uh, and also specifically corrupt. He believed in laissez-faire economics and tried to keep the government out of the economy. Okay. He was re-elected in 1924 on the strengths of his beliefs in minimal government, high tariffs, and low taxes. Coolidge is known for the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928, which made war illegal. Okay? Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928 made war illegal. Wow, what a fabulous idea, right? Oh, you know, you want to start a war? Well, too bad. You can't. It's illegal now. More than 60 nations signed the agreement. That would be awesome. Like, how else, you know, could you go about getting world peace, right? But what if somebody broke that agreement? What if we, we said, okay, war is illegal, so we're disbanding all of the militaries. Uh, we're taking, you know... Uh, all of that sort of defensive um, protection, all of that sort of defensing, defensive planning, we're, we're taking all of that down. We're dismantling all of it because, hey, war is illegal now. But what if somebody didn't sign or did sign and decided to go back on their word, right? This has a really good question here at the end, but think about it. How do you enforce something that says you can't fight? Because normally, if we have, you know, someone who's breaking the rules, then we have someone to go and enforce those rules. Locally, it would be a, a police officer or a, a sheriff's deputy, right? That would be locally. But they have to be willing to fight if the person who is breaking the rule does not you know, come quietly. They have to be willing to defend themselves and defend the other, uh, you know, innocent bystanders in the area if there are any. So how can you enforce a law like that? How can you enforce a stance like that if you don't have at least some people who are actually willing to, um, or able to, willing and able to fight um, to, to hold something like that up. It ended up being uh, not a terrible idea in general, but it ended up being, you know, uh, not very effective, unfortunately. Things are just not that easy. In 1924, this is the dark blue box at the bottom. I'm not sure if, how well you can see it. Uh, in 1924, the year Coolidge was re-elected, Nellie T. Ross of Wyoming and Miriam A. Ferguson of Texas were elected the nation's first female governors. In 1916, Jeanette Rankin had become the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress. So we're seeing things, uh, attitudes and things, we're seeing things begin to change slowly, you know, but surely they are actually beginning to change. All right, picture. I need you to come up. There you go. All right. So you can see on this picture... Oh, wait, let me adjust it for y'all. Trying to get all of the words to where you can see them. There we go. All right, so this page specifically says automobiles. It's got these little old-timey cars uh, drawn on it. Okay, so by the 1920s, prosperity was on the rise again. And what, what happened the first time uh, that uh, people started uh, feeling prosperous? When we had the Industrial Revolution, they started having factory jobs. Uh, they started to get away from that farming schedule where they were constantly on the clock, constantly working. Um, so this is, here we have again, we have another resurgence. So prosperity was on the rise again, which meant Americans wanted to own fancy new things, okay? They're going to start having leisure time again. They're going to start actually having time off, quote. They're going to want to, uh, you know, do things for themselves, little fun things for themselves, uh, because, you know, over here, we're going to have that opportunity and they're going to want to take advantage of it. So one of the big... Uh, changes at this point was 
Henry Ford came out with the Model T, okay? The quote, 10 Lizzie. Ford made the price of his car affordable using the assembly line system. Assembly line system here, I'm going to put a star by because Ford actually is credited with um, making the assembly line system work so well that it was able to be duplicated and now is uh, spread as kind of the standard for assume, uh, assuming, assembling things, you know, en masse, like cars are even still made today. And he let customers pay on an installment plan. Okay, I'm going to underline that. What's an installment plan? Well, this means, okay, so installment plan. We've talked about these a little bit in math where this is where instead of paying up front in one lump sum, you can make monthly payments, okay? And it's not uncommon for people to still get cars this way um, with, with a loan through the bank that you pay back per month or something like that. Um, and also mortgages, uh, when you purchase a house, mortgages work this way as well. So you get, uh, the approval, once you get the approval, uh, to borrow whatever sum of money or to go ahead and take the car in this, in this instance, you just are agreeing to pay it back at an, uh, a certain dollar amount each month for a certain period of time or until the, uh, item the house, the car, whatever, uh, is paid off. Okay. And this is, this is called using credit. Okay. So when you're, when you eval are you evaluated for credit, uh, that's showing, you know, like how, how reliable are you at paying back these sort of installment plan things? Um, do you say you're going to pay it back, but then you never do that kind of thing. And, so we're talking here about he, he actually was able to kind of institute a line of credit so that people could take advantage of the latest model, the, the new and improved um, idea for transportation, the personal automobile. Okay. So let's talk about the little five cars, how automobiles affected American life. First one up here people got jobs for good pay in automobile plants. Remember, jobs were scarce. So if we were able to put together the assembly line where every person has one job and they're making this now super popular item, which means that there's always going to be a demand, there we go. That's a source of more jobs, which is huge at this point um, in history. Number two, industries that supplied materials for cars glass, steel, fuel, etc. prospered, okay? Because it's not just about putting the cars together. It's about getting the stuff to make the parts to put the car together, right? So anything that was able to support the automobile industry, uh, even indirectly, uh, was also able to prosper, was also able to kind of ride this wave of, um, of, a, of an increase, okay? And so, the, again, this is spiraling out, ripple effect, right? Uh, so this is going to help the economy recover. All right, number three. Other industries used Ford's mass production practices. Again, he is credited, Henry Ford is credited with coming up with the idea of the assembly line and doing it so well that it was able to be applied in other mass production uh, practices, it was able to kind of spread uh, because it was recognized as that good of an idea. Number four, easier commutes meant more people could move to the suburbs. All right, so we had just talked about, um, let's see, so this is not early 1920s where we're at now. We had just talked about in 1918 the pandemic. Um, and how there was a resurgence of the pandemic uh, in November when the uh, war was over and they wanted to celebrate people properly and they wanted to have parades and social gatherings and there was already this sort of uh, uh, resurgence. They had a second wave which was even more uh, complex and deadly than the first wave 
And so it was starting to look really attractive to many people to not live in the city where the population was so densely packed, where there were so many people crowded on top of one another. So if you have a vehicle and can now commute into the city for any of your needs or to keep your job or anything like that, you know, ta-da, now you don't have to live directly in the city to handle business in the city. You have the vehicle that can take you from point A to point B. That really was a huge, huge thing at this point. And number five, the travel industry and roadside restaurants and highway construction boomed. All right, because that makes sense as you're going from place to place. Sometimes you have to stop and eat, right? Uh, and now this isn't even talking about like a McDonald's or something like that. This is talking about, okay, turns out grandma lives in the next state over. We're going to drive to see her um, and we're going to be on the road for a while. So we need to be able to, on the way, stop and get something to eat. So we're, we're this is a like a social like a cultural change that's starting to be able to be made, um, that we're, people are becoming more mobile. And so we're having lots more opportunities again, to create jobs and to focus on, uh, new industries or new parts of industry, uh, where we can actually, um, support that new, uh, more mobile type of lifestyle. Okay. Uh, it was not uncommon when this uh, first, uh, when, when the, the cars first really started becoming uh, popular and commonplace, it was not uncommon uh, for people to literally just get in the car and drive and drive away somewhere to find a nice spot for a picnic or something like that. I mean, this opened up an entire whole realm of possibilities here. All right. Now, all that jazz. The 20s are famous for this part of the nightlife kind of party scene, um, jazz music, that kind of thing, uh, flapper dresses, stuff like that. Okay. So let's talk about it. People had shorter work days, more leisure time and a live for today attitude. Okay. So it makes sense. They had just come through this uh, terrible world war. And so they were kind of in a big YOLO mood, right? You only live once. We've only got today. So, you know, why shouldn't we enjoy it? Uh, young people moved to the cities. The excitement and moder modernity of this time period gave it the nickname the Roaring Twenties. Okay, so I'm going to put an arrow by that. The Roaring Twenties came from this whole sort of um, leisure time party lifestyle. Okay. Radios became a part of every home and radio networks like NBC and CBS, that's right, the television channels actually started out as radio networks, made sure that Americans from coast to coast listened to the same programs, well, and advertisements, okay? So whereas you guys may have a standing date uh, with someone in your family to watch your favorite television show, at this point we had big tube radios that everybody would have kind of in their main room of their house, like we would have a big main TV typically, and they would gather around and they would listen to these radio dramas, radio programs, um, they'd have performances and they'd have uh, like, uh, uh, okay, so like a live radio performance could actually be like uh, the equivalent of a concert or, you know, someone singing in studio, or it could actually be you know, something acted out like an audio book, but with, with sounds and different people playing the different characters, things like that. There were so many opportunities uh, that radio brought um, for performers uh, and they're, oh my goodness, they were, they had people, you know, clambering every week trying to get to the radio on time. You know, my show's on, my show's on. So it's very much like very much like we would think about television today, but that's how important radio was at this point. The film industry grew. Hollywood became the center of a major industry. Talkies, 
as opposed to silent movies were introduced, okay? So we had silent films. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, uh, but silent films um, were black and white. Black and white uh, film used. And whenever someone would talk, their mouth would move, but the lines would be on quote unquote cards throughout the movie. Okay? So it would be like if I was trying to say something to you and all you saw was my mouth move and whatever expression was on my face, you know, whatever actions I was doing, but then to actually know what I said, you'd either have to guess and read my lips or you'd have to wait until the card popped up that had been, you know, cut into the film in between the action sequence. Uh, sequences, the, the card would pop up and it would have my line on it, like, oh no, here comes the villain, or something like that, okay? And so obviously, these movies were not nearly what we would consider a movie today, but they were revolutionary for their time, and then here, revolutionized again, now we have film, um, and we have equipment that can actually handle not only a audio, not only a, a visual track, you know, the actual movie part, the video part, but they can also handle audio tracks. So you can now actually hear what the person is saying as you play back the recording. This was huge, huge. All right, Americans followed the lives of celebrities from sports stars to pilots. So, Babe Ruth here, he's very famous in the world of baseball, and then Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart, famous pilots uh, known for their daring long-distance flights um, and, you know, acts of daring do where they're, they're just in the plane, just relying on themselves, okay? So, these sorts of people are really able to be highlighted now, really able to be followed using, you know, uh, the news that you would get across the radio. And also in uh, movie houses, it would not be uncommon for a little newsreel uh, to play, uh, especially during wartime, uh, a little newsreel to play before the movie actually started. So you were not just paying to get in and see the movie. You were paying to see a little bit of live action news broadcast um, and some other things as well. It was a much bigger event. Uh, women were voting, were better educated, and were working still mostly as nurses, teachers, secretaries, and clerks. But still, they were working. That was huge. Women called flappers wore their hair and skirts short to rebel against traditional ideas of ladylike behavior, okay? So, uh, it was generally frowned upon at this point, even still, uh, for women to have hair that was shorter than, say, about their, their in between their chin and their shoulders. Uh, they, you know, they wanted, at this point, they were still very much doing, like, um, uh, updos and, and very specific, um, very proper, prim and proper uh, hairstyles. And so this group called the Flappers, uh, they ended up cutting their hair off uh, blunt at their chin, where it's not long enough to do any sort of hairstyle like that. A lot of them got bangs, which was just, um, you know, super unheard of. At this point, we're like, oh, no, you know, like, you, how, how can you deal with your hair so short? And when it says they wore their skirts short, it means that they were scandalously above the knee, knee length or shorter. Uh, these were the kinds of things that women were doing because they were still traditionally very much expected to have, you know, long skirts, long hair done up in a very demure sort of way. 
And so these flappers, they just rebelled against that whole idea. So flappers, I'm going to underline. All right. Other new aspects of popular culture were art deco architecture, crossword puzzles, and dances like the Charleston. Uh, the Charleston is another thing that a lot, a lot of times gets associated with flappers and the party scene. Um, and it's a kind of funny dance. Uh, music was a big part of pop culture, especially jazz. Jazz originated in New Orleans. It was influenced by African-American music, and it is truly an American art form. So this decade is also called the Jazz Age, okay? Uh, so we would actually um, hear stories if we were living in this time, we would hear, oh, you know, did you hear so-and-so down at the, the newest jazz club? You you have to go on a night when they're playing. You have to go hear this latest music because it wasn't as simple as, you know, you go on iTunes and you download uh, an album. You go into Apple Music and add it. You go uh, through Spotify, make a playlist. It's not as, it wasn't as easy as that. You actually went and found where they were playing. And that's how you got to hear things. Um, and this time of prosperity really brought a lot of attention to that whole uh, YOLO party lifestyle. However, uh, we will see that it's not too long before that starts uh, catching up with people and we end up having to kind of change our tack um, as far as that went. Okay, so let's talk about the Harlem Renaissance. During World War I, many African Americans moved from the South to the North to work in factories in the Great Migration. Okay? Um, and so this is not the Great Migration that brought us across the sea uh, to settle here in, you know, uh, ye olden days when we were setting up the colonies. This is not that. This is a, a second Great Migration where we have African Americans uh, distancing themselves um, from the farming ways of the South and all of the bad juju down here regarding slavery and racism and moving to the North for better economic opportunities and stuff. But when they did that, they brought jazz and blues with them to the North, right? African Americans, uh, specifically in New Orleans, they were the ones who actually made it possible for us to have this, quote, jazz age. And they started this uh, movement of music, and they brought it with them when they moved up to the northern states to look for these um, economic opportunities. The Great Migration was met with resistance, especially by the KKK, which was no longer limited to the South. To fight back, organizations like the NAACP worked to secure civil rights. A reformer, Marcus Garvey, founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and advocated for a large-scale return to Africa. Okay, now again, what was the problem with this? Because people had uh, kind of suggested this before. These people were not necessarily born in Africa or even had any real specific ties to anybody actually over there. So whereas originally, yes, people had been stolen and put into slave ships and brought over here and sold into slavery, yes, that did happen. At this particular point, it would be just as harmful to uproot someone from their life over here and dump them in Africa where they have no connections, no experience, and they would just flounder on their own. They would be totally unprepared for life over there. The plans fell short, but he did encourage black nationalism, a sense of African-American racial dignity. All right, let's read this blue box about the KKK. The KKK was virtually wiped out at, under the force acts. Oops, I did not mean to move the picture, my bad. <clears throat> the KKK was virtually wiped out under after the force acts under the Grant administration, Ulysses S. Grant, if you'll remember him, uh, from the um, Civil War. It returned... After D.W. Griffith released his film, 
The Birth of a Nation, which portrayed the KKK as heroic. That's gross. Um, so, yeah, so this is not the exact same KKK, um, but it was never officially uh, killed off. You know, it, was, it never officially died out, unfortunately, because some people are just really committed uh, to making these terrible life choices. Uh, African-American communities thrived in New York City's Harlem, a neighborhood where overdevelopment had driven down the price of real estate. Harlem became home to many artists and gave rise... Let me see if I can finish the sentence. On the next page, if it will load. Doo -doo -doo. Gave rise to what? This... this uh, stress might might kill me. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, here. Oh, sorry. Let's move this picture down so that you guys can see what I see. All right. It gave rise to the Harlem Renaissance, a movement of vibrant intellectual and artistic development. Prominent names of this movement include writers like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and jazz artists such as Duke Ellington. All right, I'm going to go back to this first page. Here, if you can see, um, we have a little, you know, sketch drawing of Duke Ellington. He was a musician. Love him. And um, Harlem here is this area that's circled. I'm going to also circle it. Uh, a part of the island of Manhattan. Okay? So it had been overdeveloped. People started moving out faster than they were moving in, and therefore the prices fell. So, uh, people who were maybe previously uh, unable to afford something in that district now were able to move in. And so we have this renaissance um, as African-American people actually band together and they start creating this incredible art and music and so that's that's renaissance literally that means rebirth and so we talked about the italian renaissance but this particular one the harlem renaissance it was very much in keeping with the times okay because there's you know new jazz and there's new writings out and all these sorts of things it was just a really awesome sort of time as far as the production of these sorts of uh, arts, you know, happened, um, happened to be like, a, it was just a really awesome time, uh, for this sort of production, uh, jazz being sort of introduced to the country at large through the great migration, the writers, um, and, uh, the jazz clubs where people were really able to go and experience this music. It's just a really, it's just a really, uh, part of the, a neat time here. Uh, African Americans weren't the only minority group fighting for their civil rights in the 1920s. The League of United Latin American Citizens was founded, and the Indian Citizenship Act granting full citizenship to Native Americans was passed. Um, it's very important to realize that while mostly we talk about the struggles of the African Americans, we were still also having struggles um, with other groups as well, not being treated as uh, full citizens of the United States, whether they actually, um, you know, had been born over here or were immigrants themselves. They, they never, again, this is part of the nativism. They still were seen as other, uh, and so they still had to fight quite a bit to get their civil rights uh, set up the way that they wanted, um, or to even get any of them at all. Backlash. My, rapper, blah, blah, blah. Backlash. Rapid modernization also created a backlash, especially in rural areas. Okay, so not even as much the big cities, but little podunk country towns and map dot little eensy weensy towns where... It's harder to change folks' minds um, because this is the way things have always been done and why would we want to do things any differently? And, 
that that was where there was a lot of struggle. So let's talk about this, these struggles. More nativism. One. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. Um, more nativism. The Emergency Quota Act of 1921 and the National Origins Act of 1924 set limits on the number of immigrants who could come to the U.S. Again, this is Americans are better and we're going to take care of America first, but not in a pragmatic sort of way. It's, it's in a uh, to the exclusion of all others sort of way. Also, number two, fundamentalism. This religious movement centered on the belief in a literal interpretation of the Bible, particularly regarding creationism. Um, and creationism here, I'm going to circle it, is defined as the belief that God, man was created by God exactly as described in the Judeo-Christian Bible. Now, if you are to go into um, any and do any sort of research about creationism, um, there are some debates about exactly what the account in the Bible means. Now, does the, do the seven days of creation, do they mean seven, seven, seven literal um literal days, seven, seven little, literal, goodness gracious, that is so hard, seven literal 24-hour periods, or does it mean seven periods of time? Like it could have been, each, each quote day could have really been a week, or, you know, something like that. Uh, there are lots of things that people debate, um, as well as, you know, well, did God actually make the, the earth and the universe anyway, or was this just, you know, the whole, the big bang and ev other evolutionary theories and things like that. So creationism here, um, is talking about the specific literal interpretation. No, it was seven literal 24 hour periods. It happened exactly as it was translated out into the Bible. And that's the only stance we're going to take on that. Okay. So this next page here, in 1925, a teacher named John Scopes broke Tennessee law by teaching his students about evolution. During his trial, get this, it was called the Scopes Monkey Trial because of the idea that um, monkeys uh, and humans came from a common uh, primate humanoid ancestor. So they called it the Monkey Trial. If that doesn't tell you exactly what opinion they held of him, then uh, I don't know. I don't know what will. Uh, William Jennings Bryan represented the prosecution and Clarence Darrow and the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, defended Scopes. Scopes was originally found guilty of violating the law, but the state Supreme Court overturned the ruling on a technicality. The law itself was eventually ruled unconstitutional, as in against the Constitution of the United States. Um, however, it was not repealed until 1967, 1967, that is 40 years later, the, that they actually, you know, they, at some point in those 40 years, they did actually decide, hey, this particular law probably needs to come off the books, but it took 40 actual years for it to actually come off the books. Prohibition. Put two stars on either side of this. Prohibition uh, began in 1920. That's a ban of uh, on alcohol. Prohibited any sale and really any consumption of alcohol. Uh, uh, there was a big uh, focus on, again, returning back to normal. And they were noticing that they were having trouble with people who were down on their luck drinking too much and then violence would ensue. And so they tried to just uh, make alcohol illegal, period, across the board. But it was hard to enforce because people could make their own alcohol or buy it in underground bars called speakeasies, okay? These speakeasies would literally be hidden behind walls um, or under floors 
and uh, they would just be secret, um, see, like literal secret, like bars and saloons and things where, you know, you had to have uh, clearance to get in, not just anybody could get in, but, um, you know, they were doing this sort of black market sale of alcohol uh, as people were trying to get um, around this law, and not to mention if you were caught in a speakeasy, uh, the consequences were pretty severe. Outlaws known as bootleggers also smuggled alcohol. Some worked with gangsters like Al Capone. Prohibition made organized crime worse uh, because it gave organized crime uh, more of a handle on a, 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 like a, a black market product that was in super high demand. So it actually increased the opportunities for organized crime. And it was repealed, prohibition was repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933, okay? Um, for any of you guys that are familiar with uh, DeSoto Caverns, uh, if you've ever been or if you've at least heard the name, if you are able to go on a cave tour ever of DeSoto Caverns, uh, they actually have set up um, some... Uh, reproduction like replica stills because uh, DeSoto Caverns was actually they they found evidence that the caves the caverns there uh, were used to hide these bootlegging operations they were used to make illegal alcohol during prohibition um, and you know and store it and um, try and keep it from uh, being discovered trying to keep from uh, having to deal with those uh, legal consequences. Um, and it also was not uncommon for people to just set up their equipment out in the woods in a random spot where they didn't feel like it would be found. Um, and also if it were found, it wouldn't be found in somebody's house. So, you know, there, it would be harder to pin on any one person. I mean, this is, this was a huge, huge deal. Prohibition was, um, and it's, pretty easy to see how, you know, how crime, especially organized crime, uh, increased during this point. Also, the lost generation, this is the last thing we're going to talk about, the lost generation. Many well-educated and creative people, including writers like Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, grew disenchanted with the violence of World War I, consumerism, and the U.S. in general. Many lived as expatriates. Um, we call these, uh, sometimes for short, we call them expats. An expatriate is someone who chooses not to live in his home country. So these people here that were educated, uh, but also, for instance, you know, they were artists, they were writers. They decided that uh, with all of the drama of World War I, with all the violence, uh, with all of the socioeconomic changes that came afterwards, they, they sort of got fed up with the whole process and they decided to go live in other countries uh, instead of stay in the U.S., and try and make a go of things. All right, so I know this was super long. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. I will uh, get this posted and it will have a matching set of questions. Um, if you can kind of see here, there's going to be eight questions. Let's see if I can fit that on the screen. Yeah, uh, they're right here. Um, and so this will uh, hopefully post soon. I'm not having much luck with my videos. So as soon as it posts, as soon as it goes live, um, if you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, then you should uh, get a notification that it has uh, officially dropped on the interwebs. And, uh, you know, until that point, uh, just hold off, obviously, on answering the questions because I don't want you to I don't want you to try and get in and get confused. I, I want you to be able to hear um, hear this and kind of get some information first because um, that's just, that's just going to be better than trying to go on Google and find all of this. All right. Well, I will see you guys later, and I hope you have a great and wonderful day.